Now let me move on further to defamation, right? Defamation is another concern by chatbots. There was a simple query that was posed by certain uh, uh, testers of the model, which US law professors, professors have abused their students, okay? A chatbot fabricated a response to this, accusing a well-known professor. It didn't just make up some names. It actually said this person has been accused of abusing their students with no basis. The problem here is that users may easily confuse a language model for a knowledge model. Moving on, there's also, of course, disinformation and misinformation, right? Um, here are three examples on this slide. I'll give you the images because, of course, this is an image-heavy area, right? First, this was an example of the allegedly burning Pentagon that came out on the web a few weeks ago, right? And this, of course, is a fake image, but it was enough to lower stock prices for, I believe, about five, 15 minutes or so while people tried to figure out, was there an explosion at the US military base or not, right? So that's a big issue. I also think the problem is that when you have sort of potentially irresponsible models interacting with irresponsible owners of social media like Elon Musk, this is a huge problem, right? Um, Elon, Twitter just decided to sell blue check marks. So of course, someone who has no relationship to Bloomberg has the, uh, the tech check mark for Bloomberg feed, okay? So it can create tweets of the image that give a sense that a totally false sense of alarm, right? And I know that everyone in the audience probably, had, or many in the audience had a, a, a very troubling situation of a false alarm relatively recently. So I know this can be a very worrisome thing, right? Um, also here's AI generated images um, by Ron DeSantis against Donald Trump. Of course, given how much misinformation Trump produces, you might think this is just fair, um, but it still is really problematic. And, so, and again, this group Verify, I think, is showing sort of an ideal way of identifying and immediately debunking these types of images. Finally, what I think is kind of interesting, you know, James Vincent recently reported on this issue. The top Google result for Johannes Vermeer was this girl with the lighted parallel earrings, right? And it's kind of fascinating to think that there might be students coming out who will associate this as Vermeer versus the incredibly beautiful, subtle images of light that we know from the real Vermeer, right? And that, again, I think is a species of disinformation. Another example, you know, I think tied into number three is premature disruption, right? We have examples of chatbot therapy, a lawyer using ChatGPT for a brief and at fabricating cases, a judge using ChatGPT to write part of their opinion. This happened in Colombia and was uh, described on the Verfossen's blog, an excellent blog on legal matters, and even a man committing suicide after a lengthy conversation with a chatbot. The first example I give on this slide is one that came from the National Eating Disorders Hotline, which had uh, a chatbot called Tessa, which was supposedly going to be supercharged or enhanced by having an, a generative AI elements added to it. But instead, what ended up happening is the chatbot gave advice that was not indicated for people with eating disorders. So this, I think, is a huge problem in terms of thinking about the future of generative AI. How are we going to vet this, right? On the one hand, it's supposed to be much cheaper than, say, the human experts who now exist. But on the other hand, what happens if it is actually giving bad advice that needs to be vetted by humans. I mean, just as with a self-driving car, if a self-driving car always needs a guardian driver, maybe we're not in much better situation than just having a car, a driver without the self-driving, right? So that's sort of is the worry that I would have. Um, also, what about spam? Thinking also counterfeit people are quite troubling, right? These are all people who do not exist. None of these people exist. They're just sort of, they were generated even in 2020 by a site called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Well, if we can combine the images from thispersondoesnotexist.com with the text from ChatGPT, then imagine you could have thousands, tens of thousands, millions of social media profiles. To the extent that you have situations where the ordering of information is being generated by uh, feedback from users, if the users are fake, the feedback is fake, and the whole system starts to collapse in on itself, okay? We've already criticized algorithms. What I, what I also find amazing, a recurrent theme of my work is, you know, I was highly critical of algorithms in Facebook 
in my last book. Oh, I'm sorry, just, just to, to note as well, the problems with counterfeit people is that the Gresham's law of mediated social interaction, that essentially that just as in with money, if you counterfeit money, the bad money drives out the good and people can't rely on currency anymore. Similarly, if there are so many fake people, social interactions are going to be really degraded because you won't know if you're dealing with a human or a bot. Now, what to do, okay? Well, luckily, we have legal responses. I will go through these quickly. I'm happy to talk further about them in the Q&A. I think we'll have a good chance to do that as well. But my book, Four New Laws of Robotics, I think you can apply each of the new laws that I developed in the book to generative AI. The first new law of generative AI that I, AI that I would put forward is that it should complement professionals and not replace them, okay? In law, for example, having attorneys reviewing complaints, briefs, and motions before they're filed. In medicine, physicians reviewing diagnostic and prescribing features. And sometimes you may have a profession that really pushes back and says, don't use it at all. For example, there's the Writers Guild of America, right? The writers of Hollywood films um, have taken, gone to the bargaining table and said, don't use it. It's not like that we don't, we don't want to work with it. We don't, want, we don't want to work with it at all. And this is fascinating, right? And I, I love the signs here. I mean, some of them said, AI wrote this, this sign. AI has no soul, Rich wrote chat GPT this. It's a very funny signs, right? Sort of giving a sense of people's resistance to being replaced. And my prediction is that some sectors of labor will self-organize and demand a greater role in governing innovation like generative AI, and others will not, and they'll end up being governed basically by it and finance. So to paraphrase Doug Rushkoff, who wrote the book Programmed or Be Programmed, it's govern generative AI or be governed by it. Okay, that's the, the stark choice that I leave you with today. The next point that I would say is the second new law of generative AI um, is AI should not counterfeit humanity. This is something I've run into some issues with, uh, with uh, robotics folks, but I think that in general, I still stick with it, so that counterfeiting faking humanity is really quite troubling. And Carissa Valise has proposed, for example, that generative AI should never use emojis because an emoji refers to a face which it does not have. It refers, if you look in the literature on emotions, to sociobiological determinants of our affective responses to uh, our environment, which again are not shared by a massive neural net. And so also I'd say no use of I or rhetoric of selfhood, no faking of emotions, and deanthropomorphize its responses. What would that look like? Well, a recent paper by Abercrombie, Curry, and Talat has uh, called Mirages on Anthropomorphism has put forward these two possibilities, right? This is the bad one. All of these, I think, are ways to sort of avoid arms races and avoid sort of competitions that are ultimately zero sum. Finally, a fourth new law of generative AI is attribution. Um, this comes out of my 2018 article toward a fourth, new, fourth law of robotics. Um, and one of the things that I argue is that generative AI should always indicate itself as such with ready identification of the identity of its creators and controllers and the data sets it was based on. And I would say if you want more good ideas, I highly recommend the Electronic Privacy Information Center report, Generating Harm, which lists all the harms or, or a huge number of harms of generative AI and how it might be regulated. So to close today, um, oh, and here's also our stronger rules. You know, you could have stronger rules saying just fake, because this is a, a fake image of the Pope in a puffer jacket, right? And you might say, if you put it out there like this, not only should you indicate that it's from generative AI, but also that it's fake. You can do that sort of thing as well. So to conclude today, what I want to say is that we can apply the new laws of robotics to generative AI. I think it's a relatively straightforward application, actually, in many of these areas. I don't say that all the ideas I put forward solve all the problems. They certainly do not. But I think we could look forward to a world of much more human-centered generative AI, of much more responsible generative AI, if we were to put forward some of these basic principles, principles of complementarity, between professionals and generative AI, a principle of authenticity, it's not counterfeiting humanity, a principle of cooperation to avoid arms races and competitions that are wasteful, and a principle of responsibility and attribution. So with that, I really look forward to the discussion. Thank you.